I guess we should mention Salvatore, the the gay guy. Yeah. Um, no, he's not gay. He's just Italian. <laughs> Can't believe he just said. Somebody <laughs> says, "Hey, Sal, you have a girlfriend," and he says, uh, "Hey, I'm an Italian." <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave. For those that don't know, Vassals of Kingsgrave is a side project started by listeners of a podcast of Ace and Fire, where we review and discuss a large number of topics, including books, movies, short stories, and anime. Uh, today we will be discussing the first and second season of Mad Men. My name is Glenn, aka Dagos Rivers, from a, pod- um, a podcast of Ice and Fire forms. Joining me today are... 42. Hey guys, uh, this is Vikram, I go by S42 on the forums. <laughs> also joining me is Bina007. Hi everyone, this is Bina. Sorry, I paused to take a sip of my martini. I've decided to do this podcast in true Don Draper fashion, so uh, <laughs> I have a very nice well, it's like a martini here. <laughs> on, uh, exactly. With um, all the guys and we have our drinks out. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a drink out. It's uh, it's a cocktail hour in the UK, and the smoking light is on, so I'm very much uh, in spirit of the season, literally, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember. I don't remember any other show where people drink and smoke so much. Yeah, I think that <laughs> contributes to the cool of it, doesn't it? Just it was a bit of a shock when it first came out, just seeing that many people smoking, especially seeing Betty smoking in front of the kids. It was quite shocking. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I wanted to save this up for later, but the moral superiority thing, I mean, this show does it a lot. I mean, it shows the people in the in, in 1960s, you know, smoking, even pregnant ladies smoking and the racism and the misogyny and all that kinds of stuff, uh, drinking and driving and things like that. I just sometimes feel like this the show takes it too far. I think it's fascinating that that's the the concept of the first episode where you have all of the reports coming out that smoking will kill you, will give you cancer, and have to fight against that to produce an advertising campaign for a, um, a cigarette company. Absolutely. But I think that attitude towards the evils of the 60s is a little bit complicated because I think there's definitely a sense in which the show is asking us to judge them, but it is also showing them as being very cool, right? I mean... A lot of that, there is a certain glamour to that lifestyle. I think a lot of the yeah, reason why some people yeah. watch it is, God, it wasn't it awesome when we would have had corner offices and gorgeous secretaries and you know, <laughs> <laughs> been able just to, when we're hungover, just take a little nap on the couch in our office for two hours and get the secretary to cover. I mean, I certainly think there's a bit of a glamour to that. Um, like right, I remember. I remember when uh, when they bought their first car, when they bought the Cadillac, they went on a picnic, and after after the picnic was done, they l- just left all the litter on the litter <laughs> on, uh, in the park and just left. They were throwing cans of beers around, and they just left. And uh, yeah, it's odd because whenever I remember, whenever people talk about you know back in the day, it's all na- nostalgia. It's always ah the good old days. It's always reverence to it. This is odd. This is the only show where I feel like they're kind of saying, hey, we come off a long way. We are better than them. But it's not that long ago, is it? I mean, I I remember talking to my boss, who is, um, I think he's been trying to quit smoking for like 50 years. And he was talking about how even 10 years ago, he was in an office with a colleague of his, and they just always have a bowl on their table just overflowing with fag ends. And you'd walk into that office and there'd be like a cloud of it. Hey, they, I think it's like you forget how recent it was that officers were like that, um, and that all the secretaries were like cute women at the typing pool. Yeah, I think I was flying recently and they had a smoking sign on, and I was like, why do they even have a smoking sign? It's always on. I mean, no smoking sign. It's always on. It's not like they're going to turn it off or something. <laughs> True. Oh, well, but we're jumping ahead, right? So I guess we should get back to sort of lemon cake scores and whatnot. So lemon cake scores for the first two seasons, I guess. Oh, yeah, as you wish, Glenn. So as the newest viewer, why didn't you tell us how you got into it and 
so far what you make of season one and two? Of course. Well, I'm not that new. And in fact, I mean, it might seem like I'm just not interested in the show. <laughs> <laughs> because I have watched the first two seasons and that was three years ago. So oh. that was... Um, but I still watch the show on repeat all, a lot, but I've just not never got around to watching or buying <laughs> the third uh, to fifth season of the show. Is that related to the fact, because it switched channel in the UK, didn't it? Because it used to be on free to air channel four, am I right in thinking? And then it went to Sky, which is pay-per-view. I always want to have that effect. Yet the I still, I do have Sky Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> you got no excuse, I love it. And it's all on demand, like it's on box sets on Sky On Demand right now. So I had got into the show because I was watching Ugly Betty at the time, and there was, in the second to last episode of the show, Brian Back came on the show as Amanda's long-lost father. And then I was also listening to the Ugly Betty podcast that um, Becky Newton and Michael Urie do, and they had him on the show. And they were just talking about how great Mad Men was and one of the best shows on TV. So I got interested in the show from that. That's how easy it is to sell me on a show. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, podcast recommendations should always be taken seriously. (laughs) Of of course they should, yep. (laughs) So I I was working at the time and um, was just on a lunch break with a friend and we were walking into HMV. And um, I seen the season one and two box set. And I said, hmm, I like the look of that show. I didn't buy it at the time, but my friend bought it. Then a week later, he said, you know, I don't really like this show. Do you want me? Do you want to buy the box set from me? <laughs> <laughs> and he only gave me a one pound off the <laughs> a one pound friend's discount. But um, so I bought that and uh, watched the sh- uh, both seasons and um, still like the show. But I guess. Not enough to buy the third season or beyond the second season. Or indeed just commit to watching it for free on Sky. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And how would you rate each of the seasons so far? I think I would give both seasons four lemon cakes. Okay, that's good for you, right? I mean, you're normally quite a harsh marker. True. (laughs) Yeah. And Vikram, what's your backstory with Mad Men? I, I actually don't remember. I don't know if it was a co-worker who recommended it or I started watching it because it was winning so many Emmys. I mean, this show basically is ruling the roost. I mean, it won an Emmy in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, outstanding dramas every year, including, you know, best actors, best guest actors and things like that. And I think that's probably the reason why I kind of heard of it and started watching it. So, but I've been up to date on with it for like a couple of years now, so it's much longer than that, I think. <laughs> and have you rewatched season one and two for this podcast, or are you going from nostalgia? Yeah, I think I've went through the entire series now a couple of times. Wow. Uh, uh, so, yeah, but it's been a while since I watched season one, and when I rewatched it, kind of have to say it's it's kind of like one of my favorite seasons, I think, I because. I, I guess the further the things goes, they add more characters and, you know, and there's more the situation thing. But season one spent time just on the characters. We got to know who's Pete, who's who's Dawn, who's who and all that. So I appreciate that. So season one, I, guess, I have to say, is like my favorite season of so all that, time. And Vikram, what's your um, lemon cake score for each season? Oh, okay. Uh, just in order of things, uh, or, or for all the seasons, you mean? Just season one and two, I guess, because you know, oh, make okay. it, yeah. I I would say season one is my benchmark. So season one is five five lemon cakes. I would deduct a couple of you know maybe four point five or something for season two. Uh, just because you know it's hard to repeat what it did in season one yeah i would probably go very similar i think season one is about as perfect as tv gets i'd give it you know five olives and martini my martini and then <laughs> season two i would say i found well we can get can get onto this later i found the duck storyline a bit weaker so maybe a four i think it definitely lost a little bit of pace for me and i watched it just as it came out on tv it came to the uk already quite hyped i think from the u.s and you know 
there were lots there was lots of chat about you know the cultural importance of it so i've just watched it as it's gone along but actually i'd never rewatched it but for this podcast i did go back and watch season one and two um and really enjoyed it kind of speed watched it box set watched it Mm, um just just reminded me how amazing season one was um which is great i think but why do you think then that because it's never really gotten massive ratings, has it? It's always been a critical, not commercial success. Why do you think it's not been more popular? It's hard to say because <laughs> I guess we are a wrong crew to ask because we all love it, right? <laughs> we all like it. It's one of the shows that just gets better and better the, every time you rewatch it. You kind of understand more. more. Uh, it's one of the shows It's very subtle. So. Oh, I was just going to say, I th- that's the thing, it's very subtle. There is no explosions, nobody's gone into comas or have amnesias or something. You know, it's it's people's day-to-day life. There's no dragons. <laughs> no dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and no nudity. There you go. Um, I always find it amazing that you can get these dramas that are really popular, which are also quite subtle, um, but this one just never seen. Like, I would say The Sopranos, similarly, okay, it was set in a mafia, so there were occasional punch-ups and whatnot. But that, again, was very much about character and and slow-building character development storylines. And I've never really understood why um, Mad Men didn't get more viewers. I'm just really pleased that the network has chosen to keep up with it, despite that. Um, I guess they see it as a prestige product. Does uh, anyone have any favourite moments from the first two seasons? Oh, yeah, I do. I, it's basically, it's all the pitches for me, you know, whenever they're pitching anything, that's kind of like my favorite moment of the episode. It feels like they're building up to it, and then the pitch happens, uh, especially that pitch for the Kodak uh, slide projector thing, you know, that was so good, that was so well crafted. Especially because that particular scene when um, when Don's pitching and kind of realizing how much he really does love Betty and his family during that pitch is mm. almost exactly the same moment where Betty's revealing that she knows or is acknowledging that he's been unfaithful and it's kind of becoming cynical. So that's a really um, it's really emotionally bruising that pitch. I my particular favorite that- pitch is the one that Betty does when she wins the popsicle account because it's the first time. We've seen Peggy kind of just win an account and just do a don, like such a smooth, wonderful pitch. <laughs> so it's like, go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, um, the pitchery around uh, Helen, this divorcee. And uh, there's this one point where um, Helen is invited to a party by um, Betty and um, she's talking about Glenn's father. And one of, her, one of the friends says, is that your ex-husband? Yeah, that was Sally's birthday party, right? Yes, Sally's birthday party. There are great moments. I think one of my favourite visual shots, again, kind of like the craziness of suburban housewives, is when Betty, in this kind of very beautiful negligee, looking very snow white and pure as usual, has just made her kids breakfast and this perfect apple pie kind of scene. Then she goes out to the garden, picks up a rifle with a fag hanging out of her mouth (laughs) and starts shooting the neighbours. It's just so kick-ass, and it's so, like, not what we expect Betty, especially in season one, because she's such a little girl, isn't she, and her to pick up this gun. And then my other really favourite kind of kind of whimsical scene is when um, Pete's trying to return the chip and dip, and he has this whole, like, ten-minute conversation at the store about, this is a chip and dip, it's not under my name. I think I've said that before. It just reminds me of every kind of bad consumer experience I've ever had. And then he just comes back to the office with a huge rifle. <laughs> On store yeah, credit. Pete Campbell's rifle, and that's there to stay every season. <laughs> I forgot about how he got the rifle in the first place. Chip and dip. <laughs> it's <just laughs> genius. It's just one of those... It, that chip and dip scene to me is just one of the rare moments in season one where it really goes to real. Um, I love it so much. There was more to it, right? I mean, when he was returning the chip and dip, he was trying to be as charming as possible, but the store clerk you know, wasn't buying any of it. And here comes this guy who's, well, is he more handsome or is he more well-built than Campbell? And the, and the clerk's like, oh, all mooning over him. I think that he felt bad or as, as something. I think this marriage thing is wearing off or something. Yeah, I mean, that whole of season one, we can talk about it later, is about Pete, you know, being disenfranchised and emasculated by women, right? And that's just a classic moment. 
Um. <laughs> so yeah, let's start with Betty. Me and Mrs. Jones We got a thing Betty's a bad mother? Um, is Betty a bad mother? It's that's such a loaded question for women. I think I don't know. For me it seems with Betty that she is in the season one, she's almost like a child herself. She's so fragile and nervous and the way that the costume designer dresses her is always sort of very virginal and sort of pure. And she just seems really lost and pathetic. In season two, she becomes a little bit colder and a little bit more the kind of chilly ice queen, queen that a lot of people criticise her for being. And she does become a bit more harsh with her son. And, but then even at the end of season two, I was kind of surprised because I always kind of think of Betty as having a really bad relationship with her kids. But she's still not, you know, it's still not horrible between her and her daughter, for instance, without trying to spoil it. I mean, what yeah, do you think? not yet. But it was with Robert mostly, mostly, right? I mean, she wanted to, she wanted Dawn to be draw uh, Bobby, Bobby or Robert. They keep changing him. Actually, they keep changing the kid every season, right? I mean, <laughs> it's hard to get attached with Robert, you know. Oh, who cares? This guy's gonna get changed anyway. But anyway, she he was kind of. Like, he's like the Tommen of Mad Men, right? <laughs> it's, it's also hard, isn't it? Hard to judge Betty because. Parenthood just was different in those days. So a lot of the stuff that I think of harsh that she's like smoking all over her kids or that she's letting a nanny do a lot of the stuff. I mean, isn't that just how kids were raised in those days? Yeah, probably right. It's just a different parenting style. So it's probably just seems too alien. <laughs> and she's not without empathy to creepy Glenn. I mean, a lot of women would have just been kind of dismissive of Glenn or creeped out by him, but she kind of sympathizes with him a little bit. And when he asks for a locket of her hair, which is so bizarre. She actually gives it to him, right? That can't so, well, be Yeah, what do you guys think of this entire thing? Obviously, Glenn's mother really found it uh, disturbing, and she kind of banned him from seeing Wait, each do other. Do you think that disturbing, though, because this was after he had creepily walked in on her um, in the bathroom <laughs> and just <laughs> stared at her until she walked up and closed the door? I, I actually, maybe I'm just weird. I just found that storyline quite sweet. And I always think it's quite weird that one of the first times we see her showing affection is to Creepy Glenn. Like, she shows more affection when she's hugging Creepy Glenn or when she's getting him to wind that down the window and having a chat with him. She's more natural with him and more enforced and more herself than she ever is with her own kids or even with Don. It's like that's the only time she's herself and kind of happy. I, I, yeah, I think it's just Dawn, I think. Uh, the reason why she's not able to be very intimate with him, that she doesn't know stuff like whether he was raised by a nanny or whether he was raised by his own parents is because Dawn's very reserved and very detached, right? So we can't really blame her relation, the relation between her and Dawn on Betty. I think it's Dawn's the true culprit there. Yeah, I kind of feel that at this point in the series, I give Betty a free pass on a lot of stuff. I think she genuinely was just a very naive, a well-brought-up Philadelphia mainline girl who got into modelling and got married quite young. And she's just totally a, a child of her time, I guess. She's a bit like Sansa, right? You can blame her for a lot of her passivity and not doing much. But, you know, that she just is what she is. She's not yet grown into herself to be blamed for anything worse. I always wonder... Uh why Dawn hasn't revealed... I, I, this is season two, right? That hasn't happened yet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, spoiler again. Uh, but do you, what do you guys suspect why Dawn hasn't talked about his past with Betty? Is he trying to compartmentalize it and keep it away from his ideal, idyllic life, the suburban idyllic life? Or is or does he think Betty is too shallow and she would reject him the minute she knows who he really is? I don't think it's a question of shallowness, just maybe her youth and immaturity to accept what he is. I mean, she's fallen in love with Don. She's fallen in love with the suave advertising exec, the copywriting guy. He's She's part of his fictionalized vision of who he can be as Don Draper. Like, if she were to know, it would completely destroy that escape for him. I think that Don just wants to forget his past. That's why he doesn't want to speak to his brother. 
And mm -hmm. when he um, meets his brother in the restaurant and he says, Adam, I have one life and it only goes in one direction forward, so he doesn't want to go back to the troublesome past. Yeah, it's, it's just that uh, Betty is brought up in a very proper family, right? I mean, one of the big issues uh, Betty's, fa Betty's father or Don's father-in-law has with him is and he's kind of like, how, who, who doesn't have a family? Why doesn't he have his own people? Uh, I think the, this whole idea of compartmentalizing to argue against myself is slightly undermined by the fact that he does keep in touch with Don Draper's first wife and is evidently supporting her financially. And again, just as bizarrely, Betty is quite herself and comfortable with Glenn. I always find it quite touching how Don is very much himself and at ease and confides and it was just bizarre, right? The wife of the guy whose identity he's taken. Um, and so there can't be that much compartmentalizing going on because we have the season in season two where he's in flashback, telling her that he's met this lovely girl who looks at him adoringly. Well, maybe we could kind of transition discussion to Peggy, because Peggy is a character that Don really helps. I mean, OK, he just gives her that promotion to copywriter to piss Pete off. But at the end of the day, he does back her in that work. He does kind of vouch for her judgment. When she has the baby, he's absolutely there for her. He gives the advice, which is move forward, do whatever you have to do. Um, by the you way, know. just to confirm, he was physically there at the hospital, right? It's not like uh, Peggy was having a hallucination where she I'm sure he was there. No, no, okay, no. He, I, I think he was properly there. It's just that it just seems to me like you know, Don in many ways, if you don't, if you're not in love with him, then he's actually quite good to use. For instance, he has the um, the integrity not to want to ditch the Mohawk Airline account just for a sniff at American Airlines. He has a lot of loyalty, like, and he has loyalty towards his colleague who is basically an alcoholic and has some problems, and he doesn't want to see him rubbish. So he's a genuinely, he has some, he's not just altogether sleazy and horrible and self-interested. He can be very empathetic, and I think Betty's the main recipient of that. And that's why she's so loyal to him and why she does pick him up when he has the car crash. I mean, partly it's because she knows she'll have you know, a favour in the bank at work. But still, I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of genuine admiration. And I think he likes having a mentor-mentee relationship. It's, it, at this point, at the end of season two, I think it works well for both of them, right? Yeah, I mean, I always wondered why he's so good with Peggy. And this is when my sister kind of pointed out that, you know, he, Don kind of sees himself in Peggy just like he has a bad past. Peggy also has a past that she likes to forget, I mean, her being pregnant and stuff like that. So I think he sees, and she's also self-made, like she didn't go to any fancy college or anything. She went to Miss Stevens Secretarial School or something like that. Yeah, they both have one chance and they jump on it, right? Like he has the chance to switch identities and she has that one throwaway line about a lipstick and parlays that into a career. I think they're really similar. And I think that's, without spoiling anything, something that's developed in later seasons, how much she almost becomes done. But I love seeing the two of them together. I love seeing them interact for that reason. Does anyone make the mistake of uh, confusing Betty and Peggy? <laughs> Because of the names. <laughs> yeah, because of the names. So I, I've written down a few notes, and it's like two pages, and I've written down um, a quote from Joan, and it's, bet you wish you could pour that in a glass and drink it. Joan about <laughs> Betty. <laughs> but, I mean, this is an interesting thing, right? What is it about Peggy that everyone wants to give her advice? They're not just Don, but Joan wants to give her advice on how to dress and how to do this and how to do that. And even... Um, the, the woman with whom Don's having the affair that Peggy picks up is kind of giving her advice on how to dress. And, you know, she's like, don't try and be a man. You'll never succeed. Be a woman. And she has this wonderful line where she says, it's a powerful business when done right. Um, but everyone seems to want to give her advice. Maybe they're not uh, intimidated by her because she... See, uh, so this is one thing about this character that people... Some people say that she's really... a bad looking character or she's just a, not a good looking person do you guys find Peggy attractive is she but she's not meant to be attractive in season one because she's meant to look she's I think you know I think Peggy the actress playing her is very pretty Elizabeth Moss and if you see her in Top of the Lake which is a um, 
a mini series done by the Sundance Channel where she plays a New Zealand detective and she's in contemporary dress with a very modern haircut. She looks stunning. But in season one, she comes into the series and she's dressed to look like a Catholic schoolgirl from Queens, a <laughs> working class girl, deliberately. And then they give her the kind of the very subtle weight gain and the fat suit. And they, you realise in retrospect they've kind of put stuff on her face to make her face look bigger. Um, and she, she is, she's the ugly duckling who becomes a swan, or more of a swan, I guess, by season five. But yeah. I, I think she's meant to not be attractive. And so, because by doing that, they're making a strong point about how sexist that world was and how the guys feel no compunction about, you know, taking the piss out of her when she puts on weight. Um, when they're saying everyone's a Marilyn or a um, Jackie. And like she's like, which do you see me as? And they're like, Gertrude Stein. I mean, everyone's really <laughs> mean about how she looks. And I think that's just brilliant costume design. You know, they make Joan look so glamorous, but they really do make Peggy look very dowdy indeed. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of thinking maybe that's because of her looks, people are not too intimidated by her, especially the ladies. They feel like they're not competing with her or something, and so they feel like giving her advice or something. But you're right, I mean, the first day on a job, I think Pete said that, she, was, was she Amish or something? <laughs> exactly, which is, so, which is so brilliant. The other thing I think about Peggy is she speaks in a really soft, quiet voice. Like, even when she's saying some quite mean things, or even when she's saying to Buck, to um, Roger Sterling, you know what, I want this account, I want that office. She always does so in a really kind of girly, quiet voice. And maybe that's the secret of success. If you just look unthreatening enough, you'll get to the top. So I'm, I'm busy taking notes. <laughs> I should, yeah, I should um, incorporate that into my work still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start dressing Amish to work from here. <laughs> it's the way forward. Maybe it only works for women. Yeah, I, th I think that kind of um, talking quietly and looking a bit naive thing. And yet, she really does stand her ground. Um, I do see a lot of Sansa in her, I have to say. <laughs> Sansa? I was kind of going da Danny or something. <laughs> no, because Danny's very obvious in her power play. Danny would. Maybe we can do this as a stupid game at the end. Which character are they most like? Because but I think he's like. Idea. Uh, <laughs> I think Peggy's more of a hidden. She's more stealth, isn't she? She's sneaky ninja. She's um, she comes across as really girly and hasn't got a clue and naive. And but she stands up for herself when it matters. Um, so, and, yeah. I mean, Peggy is a very popular character among people. I think. I think everybody's rooting for her. Everybody wants her eventually to kind of succeed, Dawn or something. Uh, and uh, I mean, Betty has a lot of critics, right? I mean. Uh, I don't know about Joan, though, but I, you kind of don't want to like Betty. I actually don't fully like Betty. That's why I made the bad mother comment. But I don't think anybody dislikes Be uh, Peggy. Yeah. You think it's a calling Peggy Betty. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Remember but when yeah. in season two, I think this happens, that uh, they buy a new photocopier and it goes into <laughs> Peggy's <laughs> office? Yeah. But hey, she stands up for herself when she wins an account. She parlays it into her own office, right? And she, I, I kind of see her relationship with the Don a little bit like Sansa Littlefinger. And I think she's she's clever. She is clever. Like Roger Sterling says, you know, she, in her sweet little convent school voice, he says, there are 30 guys out here who don't have the balls to ask me for that office, so it's all yours. Um, so, yeah, I, I love Beth, Peggy, and I think lots of people do. And I think Elizabeth Moss is probably one of the strongest actors in the show. So it's, it's really compelling. And also she has she has the classic fantasy series coming of age character arc as well. So that's really interesting. I did not realise that she was in The West Wing until I exactly, looked up that's on Exactly, that's what I know her IMDb. from. Then. Exactly, I know her from there. That's where I first saw her. And she wasn't a pretty character in there, too. <laughs> the guys need to watch Top of the Lake. I mean, number one, she's amazing in it. Her New Zealand accent, it's not perfect, but it's really good for an American. And she looks stunning. I mean, she really does look very pretty indeed. And I think it's always interesting that whenever you see award shows, um, I always think that Elizabeth Moss looks really stunning on the red carpet, or as Joan, who looks stunning on the show. It always feels like the um, stylists have difficulty dressing her figure for the red carpet. You never quite get it right. A uh, Joan and Roger, or just Joan? Oh, we can do them both.
Joan is just so awesome. I mean, the scene in the Belle Jolie lipstick testing when she bends down to put the cigarette out and all the guys secretly watching behind the glass again, and like, and Ken Cosgrove, I think, has line, I'm just going to stand up and salute that, <laughs> whatever the line is. It's brilliant. So I love spending time with Roger and Jane. And I think Jane is, um, I think what's really interesting is she has that chance to kind of be like Peggy when she's doing so well on the TV readings, but just decides to marry the doctor instead. Oh. Mm. And he turns out to be a total sleaze bag. Yeah, the thing Roger and Joan had, I mean, it's not a simple thing, right? I mean, it is very serious. Do you guys think if Roger and Joan married each other, would it succeed or would it flop? No, it wouldn't succeed. And Joan just says it absolutely perfectly when they're in the hotel room in season one. And she says to him, half the stuff you love is the sneaking around. You know, that's exactly Roger's M.O. And then we see in season two when he does marry a secretary. I mean, OK, it's not Joan, but he's not satisfied with it. So there's, there's definitely a, there is a love there, but I don't think it's the kind of love that makes a good marriage. And I think Joan's clever enough to see that. I think the tragedy is, is that she kind of goes for the conventional, you know, marry a doctor mode. And he just turns out to be a complete asshole. Yeah, I think it was the first episode itself when, uh, when you know, when uh, she, Joan was doing, showing Betty and uh, she kind of said, hey, play your cards right and uh, you don't even have to work. You can move to the country or something. I think that's her long-term plan, though, but I guess she doesn't really want to settle down. To I mean, she wants what Betty, she kind of, she says that she wants what Betty's got, which is the rich mm-hmm. husband and uh, life right. of ease. But actually, she loves the power play. She loves being in the office and ruling the roof. So, yeah, she yeah. likes running the place. You know, this is the Joan that we've seen, like I say, in that Belle Jolie scene. She does this thing where you know that she knows she's got every single guy in the palm of her hands. And then she's reduced to kind of basically pimping herself out for a husband who's a doctor. So that's kind of a social status thing and letting herself get raped. It's horrible. They, they find out about uh, her true age, right? I mean, I remember there being a scene where somebody finds her driving license or something and sticks it on the wall, and she's kind of old. She's like 32 or something, and all the other girls were laughing at that. Because yeah, that's another the age where you should be a married and have children. Yeah. Because Betty at the start of the season is only 28, I think she says to Glenn. And she's and, got um, two years old. Helen's 32, and she has a nine-year-old son. Yeah, so... Um, very much so. Uh, are you sure? Because Pete was only 26 years old. So, so uh, he's a man. He's a man. I think, I think there would have been a social stigma attached to Joan for not being married yet. Plus, she's been married. Like, when she says to her fiancé, the reason Roger knows me so well is I've been working here for nine years. And that would also make sense, starting at 22 after secretarial college and then into that job. So, um, yeah, poor Joni. And it's kind of like, I find with Joan, Joan's like the aria of the series for me, because I always forgive her even when she does quite heinous stuff. So she's so mean to, um, oh, what's his name? What's the guy with the black girlfriend? Oh, uh, Kenzie. Paul. Kinsey, Paul yeah. Kinsey. When she goes to Kinsey's party and she's like so bitchy to his girlfriend. Like, Joan can do really mean, mean, horrible bitchy stuff. But I always forgive her because she's just so lovely. <laughs> And so charismatic. I can forgive Joan almost anything. I wonder what happened between her and Kinsey. I mean, uh, this is from the second last episode of season one, the Nixon uh, versus uh, Kennedy thing, where uh, they find Kinsey's play, right? Uh, 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 and they and put on... Reenact- it's reenact <laughs> They reenacted. That was such a funny one. Obviously, the main character was supposed to be Kenzie, and Joan was playing Joan there. And... Yeah, I wonder what happened, why they broke up. I think they would have been good together. Oh, I don't think Kinsey's man enough for Janie. <laughs> <laughs> she she has an interesting path, and I think, you know, at this stage, at the end of season two, she's still kind of naive and still... She's a bit like Sansa, actually, and suppose she believes in that romanticism that, you know, if she can just knit, bag the Doctor, everything will be okay, and life will unravel itself in order, and I guess that's going wrong after the rape scene. And then I was having this discussion with a friend of mine, and she was saying she wondered how far Joan even thought of that as rape, because when did marital rape become a kind of legally possible thing? Because it was quite late, I think, that up until quite recently, 
or comparatively recently, there was no such thing as rape within marriage. So maybe she just thought he kind of has the right, he's my fiancé, I'll just let him go on with it. You're probably right. I mean, this probably is just too uh, uh, far ahead. Yeah. Sad. Okay. Can we, uh, shall we talk about Roger and Sterling stuff too? Yeah. I mean, does, do we have anything else to say about Roger? <laughs> oh, sorry, Ken, go ahead. They're about to meet um, a client and they have to climb um, to the top floor um, uh, climb oh, stairs because the elevator is out yeah. of order. Oh, when he, like, vomits all over the carpet. <laughs> that was such a, I mean, that was the Dawn's revenge for uh, Roger coming on to his wife, right? I mean, he intentionally, uh, I mean, they intentionally drank so much at lunch, and he paid the, the guy who runs the lift, the lift operator, to act as if it was out of order. And so that was his revenge, right? Because this is the Kennedy people were coming to visit, and uh, before that they went out for lunch, and I, there was a scene where Don paid the guy who operates the left some money, and I think that's uh, that's what it was for. I think to, it's just to a act brilliant. as if it's a brilliant. yeah, that was, and that, I and it was so funny that. because I'm sorry, just one of the one point was that it, because it happened right before Roger had a proper heart attack, so that event could have worsened things. I think I think the fact that he like smokes like a chimney and drinks like a fish. I mean, it was going to happen anyway, wasn't it? But what I love about that scene is that it's almost like horror movie vomit. It's like a ludicrous quantity of vomit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so kind of like, and because up until that point, Mad Men has just been so stately and so civilized in the way it's filmed and so classy, and then just like the show shocker, Roger just chundering for Britain. It's just hilarious. Um, I totally forgot about that, but it's a great, great scene. Although, I mean, I have to say the flip side, the tragic flip side is that scene when um, Cooper calls Joan in to start faxing or, or telegraphing all the clients to say that Roger's had the heart attack. And she obviously can't betray that she's upset because she's kind of half in love with him. So sad. Yeah, I, I do. some uh, shocking facts, and that's uh, regarding marital rape. So the first thing that I found as it wasn't illegal in the UK until 1991. No. That's right. Well, this is Yahoo Answers, so take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> That's insane. Then, well, it does link to a Wikipedia article. Um, let's see. South Dakota was the first state in America to make a law against marital rape in 1975. And then by 1993, the rest of the states followed yeah, so that makes sense, right? So in the time of Mad Men, Joan would have thought ultimately... It was her duty. Yeah, lie back and think of England. What is the state in India? Is, is there such a thing as uh, that? Uh, there's no law against it. <sighs> oh. <laughs> That's awful. I'm never getting married in India. There is something there, but I'm not really sure what what's the most thing, what's the most punishment you get out of it or something. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me, because if you think that India basically inherited the British legal system as it was at independence, then it would have had all the kind of um, antiquated laws that came at that point. Makes sense, right? Um, Since we're talking about Roger, I just also want to talk about Cooper, too. And this is what I want. I want a (laughs) prequel to Mad Men, because next season is going to be the last one, right? After that, I want them to do a prequel, which is Roger Sterling and uh, Sterling Cooper, or just Cooper. Uh, because Cooper is such a good character, right? I mean, he's your, you know, eccentric, rich, wise old man, right? He knows I mean, everything he just has, about everyone. Yeah, yeah, he just knows everything, and he has the right answer for it. I mean, when he's uh, like he, Alan Greenspan, right? Because he believes in Ayn Rand, so it's no surprise when you realize he's a Randian to think that he wouldn't give a shit about the Don Draper backstory because. You know, part of believing in Ayn Rand is that, you know, the the elite people shouldn't have to obey moral conventions and should be free just to do whatever they need to do to move forward. And the fact that he has that, like, really expensive Mark Rothko painting, and he just doesn't give a, he doesn't give a crap about its artistic merit. He just knows it's going to double in value. He's just yeah. all about the money. He's just such a greedy capitalist. And yet he has this kind of goofball exterior, which I think is just genius. And his really rule about everyone has to take their shoes off before they sit into <laughs> his office. Yeah, yeah, the entire Japanese thing. 
And if and if you know if if Don cleared half a million from the buyout with only twelve percent of voting stock, I mean, how much did Cooper make? And if say he made like two million or something in those days, I mean, that guy. By the way, you guys, do you guys know how to convert uh, 1960s money to 2013 money? You use a deflator. Uh, it's it's only, it's about seven point seven times more. A dollar in nineteen sixty is equal to dollar seventy to there. So just multiply everything by eight. So he probably got about fifty mil in today's money from easy, that. Fire. Easy, a lot easy. Of money. <laughs> oh my god, he's cool. I love Bert Cooper. We just don't see enough of him. Um, he totally has uh, Roger and Joan's number about their affair. And he's actually quite sympathetic, isn't he? When Joan um, comes in to do that the um, telegraphs when Rogers had his heart attack and he says something very coded to her about don't fall for an older man like almost warning her that she's going to get hurt I mean he, he's quite perceptive he looks like a complete eccentric duffer like the moment oh. when, he walks, when they're giving the um, like congratulations you're having a baby party and he walks in and says I just want to say happy birthday I mean like in one sense he's like, <laughs> in one sense he's totally out of touch but on another sense he's completely zen master He's like the young. <laughs> I, I don't think he was commenting about Joan and uh, uh, and Roger's thing because Joan uh, was on a blind date with this other older guy. They picked up at a bar, and this old guy accompanied her to the office. So I think he was oh, commenting okay. on that, but it was a good because it was a good line to say because in a way it also was relevant to Roger and uh, Joan's thing also. Okay. On the surface, yeah. it may seem that way, but I feel like the big character that knows everything comes in and says something as advice which may seem like one thing but really it was talking about Roger and Joan Right, Mad Men does a lot, I mean you feel like people are talking about something else but it's relevant to something else again so uh, yeah I, I'm, I'm going with my Bert Cooper as like a Zen master Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because because the Menkins, the father of the Menkins chick, when he called, I think uh, Sterling, uh, sorry, uh, Cooper immediately picked it up and understood what it was when uh, when Menkins father called up and said, hey, my daughter's going on a cruise. He immediately understood that Don and his daughter had something to do. Yeah, the guy's no schmuck, right? I mean, he knows what he's talking about. Right. So who was the guy who in the show notes he put Campbell the sleazeball? Oh, that was me. I mean, uh, <laughs> shall we talk about Campbell now? Campbell yeah, is like, a good choice. Did they have your feelings, mate? Just tell us how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that first episode was so. I mean, I fo- completely forgot about it when I rewatched it, and everybody was being so sleazy towards uh, Peggy, right? I mean, Ken Cosgrove. I mean, he's probably the nicest guy uh, in the entire show, and he was being like, uh, you know, uh, you know, sly towards uh, her. <laughs> Pete's an interesting character. Do you guys hate him? Do you guys like him? Because I'm, as time goes on, I'm kind of liking him more. I think that any guy, you know. Whatever he becomes later, he's a guy who's, you know, an achiever, who knows that his father doesn't really think much of his chosen career. And he's married this girl who has this much wealthier family who's quite controlling. And he's always trying to fight against that, and it's forced to be sneaky. Um, But he's clever, right? He's smart. He's the guy who, when they're doing the Nixon Kennedy campaign, um, decides to buy up all the TV ads using another account, the... um, the laxative account. So, <laughs> you know, he's smart. I like the fact that he's smart. And I think that, okay, he did try and do the dirty on Don with the knowledge, but, you know, in a way, why not? I mean, that's the world they were living in. So, I don't know. I give, I give Peter free pass in seasons one or two. I think he's, um, he's just a young, frustrated guy with lots of issues. Yeah, so and, and he's kind of he he's kind of becoming the new uh, comic relief character. I think. I mean, s- several of his lines come out very funny. I think. Uh, yeah, well, chip, I can't and dip. Remember. chip and dip. Chip and dip. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think and, and would happen if Peggy had told Pete that she was pregnant? Do you think he would have been good? He would have left Trudy and, and married her. 
There's no he, no way he would do that. <laughs> I, I, I think Peggy would have said something, but I think it's because, uh, you know, the entire scene where he kind of goes on about him liking to hunt, him wanting to hunt something, bring home the meat, uh, have his wife cook it for him, put it on the table. So, you know, he wanted so a very creepy. submissive <laughs> wife. And Trudy did not turn out to be that. He thought Peggy was like that because the way she was dressing and everything. But then when Peggy does the Belgian thing, he's like, okay, Peggy is not the same too, so. And he says, I don't like you this way or something, right? I kind of see him as a mirror image of Joan insofar as Joan thinks she wants to be the submissive housewife. And Pete thinks he wants a submissive housewife. But actually, when he declares his love to Peggy at the end of season two... I think what he likes about her is that she is intelligent and that she is his match a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, Joan, when she's given the choice of being, you know, the, the doctor's wife, kind of misses her role as the office, you know, the office lady. So I think they're both kind of interesting. They both go for these very conventional marriages. And Pete, we see first, he really doesn't get on well with that. Um, but Trudy is really interesting, I find, because she comes across as so sympathetic and sweet. But actually, she is quite controlling watching season mm-hmm. one again. Like, she gets the apartment she wants. She goes on and on and on about having a kid. And, you know, there's this really creepy line. I think they're in a taxi cab coming home from a work function. And she says, well, I got you, didn't I? And you think, my God, yeah, you're quite quietly manipulative, aren't you? She reminds me of, she reminds me of um, Ellen Archer in... Um, the Age of Innocence. And there you go, random Henry James reference. <laughs> <laughs> she seems all quiet and, and sort of decorative and pathetic, but actually she's working under the surface to get exactly what she wants. Right, whenever she comes to office to see Pete, she actually calls the secretary first, checks to see if she, he's actually busy, and then comes down. And poor Pete is like making an excuse, oh yeah, I'm busy, I'm a meeting or something. And she says, no, you don't, I checked your calendar or something. You know, instead of <laughs> calling him and asking if she wants to see him or not. <laughs> what do you think of Pete's relationship with Don? Like, there are a couple of times when he, like, on the one hand, he tries to blackmail him, but on the other hand, he's like, it really matters to me that you are impressed with what I'm doing. Like, does he want Don to be his dad, or does he see Don as a competitor? I mean, it's it's so weird. Mm-hmm. I think he yeah, think... still sees Don as uh, competition. He wants Don's job one day, and that, why can't that just be today rather than <laughs> next year? <laughs> and so Don is standing in the way of the life that he wants. But yet he does, I suppose respect Don. Yeah, it's, uh, I think he was really jealous of Don when he was up for the partnership, right? When Roger got, uh, when Roger had his heart attack in, and everybody was worried about the state of the company, they made uh, Don partner and Pete was really jealous of it. And uh, and this was pointed to me by this other podcast I listened to. Uh, it's called Mad Men Happy Hour. It's a pretty good podcast to listen to. And they kind of pointed out that Pete was kind of turning into Don and and I think this is probably a season five question than uh, season one and two. But do you guys think that's right? Do you guys think that Pete is kind of emulating Don? Do you see Pete ten years down the road be exactly like Don? I think Pete idolizes Don in a way. I mean, he's jealous of him. He's competitive with him. But at the end of the day, I think he wants what Don has, which is natural authority and charisma. And, you know, like... When Pete's standing in Tiffany's trying to return his chicken dip, sorry, I'm obsessed with it. And he's trying to shut up that store lady who's, like, not impressed at all. And yet Don would get any woman that he wants. Like, there's, this is really not a spoiler. In a later season, um, he invites Don to his house for a dinner party, and he's got the latest kind of um, kind of hi-fi, or whatever it would have been, record deck in those days. And he really wants everyone to be impressed by it. He's just that kind of guy. Like, if Pete were in my office today, in fact, we have a guy who's a little bit like Pete in my office today, he'd be the guy who'd get the kind of the latest Apple gadget for everyone and want everyone to know that he has it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. He's that guy. He wants, he, he, it just kills him if someone has something else that he doesn't have. Because on the surface, he has so much. He comes from this amazing patrician family. He's got this really pretty, lovely wife who also comes from money. I mean, the world should be at his feet, right? I mean, he should be 
he's kind of done without the baggage, without the the assumed identity. I think about the fifth episode. Uh, it's where he gets fired, and uh, and only because of Cooper, you know, they keep him. And then he comes home, and uh, they they're buying this place, right? And the and the building's board person comes up, and uh, and his Trudy is trying to impress them and telling him how 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 you know how Pete's great grandfather used to earn all the own all the farms around here and everything and i guess i guess he feels like he's not living living up to his family's legacy or something absolutely i mean he's always very conscious that his choice of job is disappointing and there's that awful scene with um his mum where she makes it very clear that if they adopt the kid he's not going to inherit um so yeah lots of social pressure lots of social pressure but he responds in quite a bitchy way, in the in the same sense that, like you say, Ken Cosgrove is such a nice guy, despite everything. He also right. makes comments about he always has to compete for his job because there will always be younger people coming in and they want fresher ideas within advertising. As you know, he invented direct marketing. Turns out there was already direct marketing, <laughs> but he actually <laughs> invented it. So he is smart. He has a certain low cunning. I like Pete. Um... Should we, are there any other, like, sort of random minor characters before we move on to the big one and on? I mean, I, I guess we should mention Salvatore, the, the gay guy. Yeah. Um, no, he's not gay, he's just Italian. <laughs> I can't believe he just said that. Somebody <laughs> says, hey, Sal, you have a girlfriend, and he says, I, hey, I'm an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Poor Sal. And then when there's that kind of young Russian guy in the office. And um, they're like, oh, you're taking Peggy out. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm a homosexual. And Ken's like, I don't think that means what you think it means. Oh, no, no, I make love with the men. (laughs) (laughs) And Sal's face is just like, oh, my God, I can't believe he went there. And everyone else is just so mean. Like Harry and everyone, oh, my God, he's a freaking pervert. And But Sal doesn't say anything. And you just think, my God, what must he be thinking? Poor guy. And yet when we meet his wife, I'm just like, oh, that's so sad. And yet to modern eyes, he looks so camp, doesn't he? I mean, in season one, he just looks so gay. And who else is there? Duck. Duck is such a conniving little shit. I hate Duck <laughs> more than I hate anybody else. And, and in a way, there's nothing to hate. He's a, he's a sympathetic character. He's fighting alcoholism. His wife's left him. He's quite a sad character. And yet the way in which he kind of goes behind everyone's back and negotiates that merger... It's just so sneaky, and to come out, and then they're like discussing, um, you know, they say, oh, well, we're going to make Duck president. He says, well, you know, I'm not very well prepared for this, but this is how I see the future. And just like, you, you lying little sleaze bag. I've got no time for the Duck at all. I just really, that's a very specific corporate type that I know well, and it's just horrible. Sorry, rant over. <laughs> <laughs> I hate Duck. What can I say? I actually hate Duck more than Jane's rapey husband. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I don't really hate Duck. It's he just picked the wrong enemy. He went after Dawn. So he's yeah, an as well. I mean, he's like unintelligent. He totally overplays his hand. Um, but anyways, so does that bring us finally to Dawn? I believe so. Yep, Dawn. Dawn Draper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's really lovable in season one and two, despite all the kind of philandering and affairs. He's um, he's very vulnerable. He wants to be loved, um, and yet he's obviously just very conflicted. I think he's just very, very charismatic and not hard on the eyes either, right? <laughs> I mean, in first season, I think he had affairs with two people, right? Midge, the artist, and then the Menkins chick. And I think the reason why he went after the Menkins chick is because she kind of pointed out who he was right in the first meeting itself. I mean, she when he goes about how love is something mad men invented, admin invented. Menken Street goes after, you feel disconnected, right? You don't fit in. And he was like, oh, no, this person knows me now. And uh, and that's why he kind of went after her. It wasn't for the sex. 
I think he just found somebody he could be open with or something. I feel like he went after Rachel because it was just like common, you know, TV trope where some new woman comes into the main male character's life and has some argument with him, and that means instantly they're going to get on. Yeah, two episodes I hate you from like now. I love you. Exactly, classic. I hate you so much. I love you, kind of thing. Like after she dissed him so blatantly in the meeting, and then he dissed her, they were bound to like have sex. I guess my my take on Don is that he has a very traumatized childhood that we'll learn more about, and he's had this wartime experience, and there's just something deeply, deeply emotionally lacking in him, and that's why he goes after all these women, which doesn't really help ultimately. Um, and it's actually quite tragic. I don't think he's a kind of sneaky philanderer in the way that Roger is. I think there's something kind of different and compulsive about what he does. I and mean, I'm not sure if he's actually a sex addict, but I think there is something much more compulsive and deep set than with Roger. Um, I think Betty says this in uh, one of her psychiatric sessions that Don doesn't know what family is. And I think that's probably why it's easy for him to cheat and stuff like that. And it's just like if you're so good at if you're so good at compartmentalizing your life, then it must come very na- It's kind of easy enough to do it. Um, but he does want family. I do think he cares for for Betty. Like when he goes when he's talking to his so to say ex wife, I mean he does look in love and he is a nice guy. Like I said, he's nice to Freddie Rumson. He doesn't want people taking the piss out of him. He's nice to Peggy. He's not like he's not an out and out. Shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do really like him, you know, and and you're right, kind of, I, if I could, I, I would try emulate him. I think it's just because he has so many flaws, right? You can easily find a flaw of his, which you could have to, and, you know, and, and kind of relate to. And, uh, yeah, even though he's so, he's so handsome, he's, you know, kind of genius in some ways, uh which would, would be a turn off to many people. Ah, he's just some arrogant guy. But because of his flaws, he's kind of approachable. Yeah, he's vulnerable and relatable. I think I, I, I love Don Draper. I think most people do, right? He's um, yeah, a prisoner of his past. And yeah, there's almost something, although he's done this kind of this brutal lying thing, there's something kind of admirable that he's not going to let his poor past take over his life. He's not going to be a victim. He's going to move forward, and he tells Peggy to do the same. I kind of admire that. And it's kind of the American, not the American dream is getting too highfalutin, but there's something quite um, get up and go, don't complain, just get on with it, take whatever chance you've been given. I find that quite admirable. Would you guys blame Adam killing himself on Dawn? No, I think Adam was probably already quite vulnerable. I mean, Adam's seen that same childhood. He's been abandoned by Don once before. We don't know enough about Adam to blame Don. Yeah, I, I just, you know, he can't help. I feel like he is, is to blame, but I just can't feel like... He, I think he miscalculated Adam. He should have realized what state he was in. I mean, he was his brother, right? I mean, he knew him for eight years. He I think should have, he... Uh rejection from Don just pushed him over the edge but he must have had um, other disappointments in his life to make him commit suicide yeah because Don's not I mean as much as he pushes Adam away he doesn't push Dick Don Draper's original wife away um, mm, that's true mind you she's not from his original painful childhood I guess but yeah, I think it's just a miscalculation on Don's part. I think, I think if Don really... I give him enough credit that if he really knew how fragile Adam was, he wouldn't have pushed him away like that. Um. And then when he does commit suicide, um, all the money goes to the state, the, the $5,000. Yeah, $5,000, that's like $40,000 in today's money. <laughs> so, um, Grand Mad Men Theory, he wrote this. Uh, that's from me, and I kind of picked it up after uh, from the same podcast, Mad Men Happy Hour, and I did not realize it. It's I only came to know of it three months from now, uh, three months ago. But yeah, so do, what do you guys think? Is the opening a spoiler? Is the opening kind of telling us the future? Is is that, that's the theory that Don is going to commit suicide at the series finale? That's oh, how wow. the show is going to end. Oh, the, yeah, this is this is a crackpot theory. Gives clues to the powers of each of the characters and 
what will happen to the characters. I, I completely disagree, but it's for reasons of what happens at the end of season five. I don't think he's going to commit suicide. Um, but let's discuss that on another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always thought him falling down is just, uh, I mean, that is Dawn, right, falling down at the intro. I thought it was just, you know, falling for the materialism and all that. Uh, you know, there's a there's a glass, there's a drink there, there's a woman in uh, uh, with her nylons on and things like that. So I kind of thought it was an analogy or something, not a real thing. Well, I think there is there is a sense in which he, is, he's, he falls deeper and deeper into this lifestyle that... I guess we see at its peak already in Roger Sterling as the seasons progress, but I think there is, um, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, but I, I don't think that's the ending for Don. I'd be quite, I would be quite surprised if that's what ends up happening. Speaking of which, though, in terms of death, I thought one of the best bits of writing, which I'd completely forgotten about, is when Pete's father dies on that flight, and you get he comes into Don's office. And this is the bit where I think that I believe Pete looks up to Don as the kind of father figure idol. He's like, what do I do? Do I make arrangements? Why am I not crying? It's just such a moving scene, and I think it's really well acted and written. Uh, One of the best death-related scenes in the Mad One, perhaps. Yeah, it's just the, the friendship these two guys have developed. It's very strange. It's not the same friendship as Roger and Don. Uh, but I would say Don and Roger are better friends, but Roger doesn't know about uh, Draper's past, uh, yet Pete knows. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. I like I like watching Pete and Don interact because it always feels like two boxes squaring off against each other, and yet also a kind of father and son in a teenage tiff. It's a really interesting dynamic. I think the yeah. hilarious is Glenn pointing out how expensive contraception was back in the day. <laughs> I know, eleven dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like 88 bucks. I know the next episode you find out that Betty, sorry, <laughs> Peggy, <laughs> only earns uh, thirty-five dollars a week. Yeah, that's like <laughs> a lot of money, right? Um, yeah, she like makes only like eight hundred bucks a month. And like the doctor's attitude when he's giving Peggy the um, contraception is, "I'm going to give it to you. It's so patronising." But, you know, don't sleep around too much, even though you're on it, because, and he, the quote is, easy women don't get husbands. I'm like, you absolute sleaze bag. Um, but I, well, I was also quite shocked to see how much racism and sexism there is, like, overtly in those early, kind of like the first half of season one, relative to season four and five. And I'm not sure that they're saying that it's less in society, it's just, it was obvious that the writers were really trying to make a point about how different the time was. Like a lot of that horsing around in the office and hitting on secretaries does kind of die down a little bit as the seasons progress and you just focus on the characters. I mean, here's the first one, right? I mean, when uh, when Joan shows Peggy the typewriter and says, oh, don't be worried about the, the all this missionary. They made it easy enough for women to use or something, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, they really desperate- tone it down. When they're, they're really trying to find a Jew in the office because the Menken's coming in. <laughs> and Roger's and like, have you, ever lo- from the mail room? have you ever hired any Jews? And Don's like, not on my watch. <laughs> it's just but, that, but that was meant as a joke, right? Because we see yeah, all these things happening. And oh. you're like, how far does it go? And I think the Jewish thing was like the stop line. Okay, they are not that bad. <laughs> but, you know, there's definitely... Um, there's definitely racism there's rampant sexism obviously um yeah i mean it's, it's just a huge double standard no i think we just have the one night maddie scorpion thing right i prefer the game that bina suggested about which characters do um characters which that they of belong characters to? from a song of ice and fire oh, yeah no that's because i think yeah, you can all agree uh, that we'd all shag uh don and joan right of course I would probably have a kind of a one night band which is like Roger and Pete Um, um, yeah exactly and Trudy and I think we all know that Freddie Rumson falls into the sort of get get donated to the the secretarial pool Um, okay, so do you want to do like which house they belong to or which character they're most similar to? Uh, I guess houses and stuff kind of like they all kind of come in together, right? I mean, yeah, let's do houses, I feel. Whichever, whatever floats your boat, boys. Um, 
Okay, so we, we can go in reverse order again. So we can start with, who did we start with? Um, Betty. Birdie. Okay. Innocent Birdie. I was going to say Sar- Cersei and Lannisters, but nah, she's not Cersei. She's no. definitely not Cersei in season one and two. She belongs to the Lannisters just because of the blonde hair, at least. She's just not smart, though. She's so submissive. She's so kind of like, oh, pathetic in season one, especially she's like a little girl. She could probably be like a minor girl in the Tyrell household. You know, when like, um, when Marjorie comes up to court and she's now the fiance of Joffrey and Sansa's looking at, yeah, and Sansa's looking at all these like silly little girls twittering around her and saying, oh, they're just so naive and innocent, still believing in knights like I used to. I think she's in that category in season one. And in season two, she's probably becoming a little bit smarter and a little bit more um, tempted and cynical. After all, she does have that one night stand, that one night shag with that guy in the bar. So maybe starting to break out a little bit. Um, so I'd say a Tyrell, because the Tyrells are very pretty. And, you know, when Marjorie comes into the city and everybody loves her because she looks so gorgeous. And I think that's kind of like what Peggy is. She's just a, a Barbie doll trophy wife. Um, Peggy? Danny, uh, going back to my things, you know, her eyes are so similar to Danny, so she's a Targaryen. But she starts off as an innocent type girl, then she um, joins the world of men. I think she's a Sansa. I think she starts off as the meek, pathetic little girl, and then she gets a mentor, a.k.a. little finger slashed on. And in her quiet little soft voice, she gets a lot of stuff done. Um, and I think she's going to end up being the Queen of Thrones. I think she's going to be done. Like, she's going to be creative director, and I think Sansa's going to be sitting on the throne. So there you go. <laughs> I'm only a little girl, I know. Yeah. I'm only a little girl, and know little of act. <laughs> but here's popsicles. <laughs> <laughs> nah, she's Danny for me. <laughs> so let's see who's next. Um, Bird Jody. Cooper or Jody. Journey? Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the Sand Snakes. Yeah, definitely. Using her body, or maybe Cersei, because she does kind of use her sexiness to get what she wants a little bit. But then sometimes gets bitten by her own plan, like when she's raped by the doctor. Are we talking about Bart Cooper? No, we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like you said Cooper there. Yeah. Right, we're talking about Joan. Okay. <laughs> no, no, we are talking about Scooper sexiness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that would be so brilliant. Well, it applies to Cooper also. <laughs> yeah. But they need to find a way to get Christina Hendricks into Game of Thrones. So. Back to, yeah, Roger and Bert. Okay, Bert Cooper the, now. The kindly old man or Blood Raven. That's for Bert. You know what? I'd make, I'd make Roger um, the Ma- Lord Mansley. Like, he looks like a good time boy, just eating and drinking too much. But underneath it all, he's got some smarts, as in a fray pie. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go Roger with uh, one of the Baratheons, I think, you know. He fits in the, the Baratheon clan. And Bert Cooper, I would say Maester Lewin, maybe? Uh, or Maester Eamon. Maester Eamon. Maester Eamon. Why? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wise and weird. Actually, you know what? Roger Stalin could also be Jorah Mormont, the guy who, like, marries this younger woman who makes him do all this, like, stupid shit. <laughs> okay, dokie. And then on to... Who have you not done? Well, Don, obviously. Who's a sex addict in Game of Thrones? Stannis. Tyrion. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tyrion. <laughs> it's got to be someone who's under a different identity. Or maybe someone like John who doesn't know really... He's a bastard, but he's rising above his poor, humble beginnings to become something great. Dario. Nah, Dario's just not cool enough. Um, <laughs> my Dario hate coming out there aren't that many kind of charismatic there aren't that many guys in Game of Thrones who are just that charismatic and that sort of yeah I mean closest I can think of is Jamie Lannister who's a good swordsman but asshole so Don's a good at advertising but but, if, but people like him right people want to impress him so, so yeah, Jamie. Jamie's Loyal to Cersei. 
Jamie's faithful. He's yes, not an me. adulterer. He's the tricky one. I think Robert is the closest, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a tricky one. Sal's the fiddler. Uh, one of the fiddler's friends. <laughs> I kind of feel like Ken Cosgrove could be like Gendry. Just like this really nice guy. He's kind of on the side of events. Have you got any closet gays in Game of Thrones? I mean, other than <laughs> Renly. Apart from Renly, obviously, and Loras. But Salvatore doesn't really fit that kind of trope. He's also older. He's older and he's got the wife and you kind of get the feeling with Sal that he's much, you know, because Renly and Loris always feel quite comfortable with their homosexuality. I mean, they do hide it from society, but they're quite, they're not ashamed of it. Like, you never get that impression. Um, right, there was this dinner with Sal, right? Sal and the Belgerly lipstick guy. But the Belgerly lipstick guy was inviting him, but Sal walked away. So. Yeah, I mean, you get the feeling that Sal definitely... Um, is ashamed of it maybe because of his Italian Catholic upbringing. So he knows he's gay, but he's trying to suppress it. Where Renly, I think, just doesn't give a fuck. He's going to shag whoever he wants to. Uh, how about Pete? Who do we think he is? Ooh. I mean, he's sly, isn't he? And black I mean, Maybe Littlefinger? Ha <laughs> Because Littlefinger came from humble beginnings. I'm kind of thinking the guy who got Harren Hall, the former captain of the Golden Gold Floats. Oh, Janos Slint. Janos Slint, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so mean. <laughs> Maybe um, Pete's Roose Bolton. But Roose Bolton's a psycho. He's not a psycho. No, he's not. Think of like a man said. who's ambitious and on the make. Um, oh, phrase then? <laughs> yeah. But he's not, I mean, come on, he's not that bad. I always feel that Pete would be in the Free Cities hustling. He might be like a, a younger version of... Um... Oh, his, uh, his dad, the guy who wanted the slave pits open, or the fighting pits open. Yeah, yeah just kind of like he'd be the guy who'd just be in the Free Cities, like turning a coin, not too worried about morality and just, you know, living a good life. Being a bit of an ambitious guy. He would be like, I don't know if you guys watched Spartacus, but he'd be batty artists. <laughs> I was wondering what you guys thought of the casting of Mace Terrell, though, for the next season of Game of Thrones. Oh, I haven't heard about it yet. Oh, wait, in fact, I did see on Facebook uh, a post about it. Let's see. Um, what has he been in? It's, I don't know, it's just a classic British character actor. I was just surprised how old they'd gone. But I suppose if it's got to be someone who pairs up with Dame Diana Rick, so maybe that was the logic. It's also not like a massively big name. It's just a classic British character. Okay, right. Can you link it to me? Because I don't know anything about this. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Let me do that. So um, Roger Ashton Griffiths. You also still don't know what um, Mark Gattis is going to be playing, and that's really bugging me. Yeah, I think last we discussed Randall Tarly or something. He's the front runner. And other than that, no real Game of Thrones news, right? Nothing else has come out. So Roger Ashton Griffiths was also in the Tudors, which I didn't watch. Yeah, that was a bit schlocky. It was a bit like, are you watching The White Queen at the moment? It's a bit like that. I'm not watching that, no. People, there's this, like, awful, because it's about to start in the USA, and there's all these, obviously, um, sort of publicity relations manager puff pieces in the half post saying, is is the White Queen the new Game of Thrones? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Just because, like, both are loosely based on the War of the Roses does not mean they're in any way, shape, or form alike. Um, I mean, it's not bad. It's quite good, like, entertainment, but it's definitely not in, up in that Game of Thrones category. Oh, wow, he was in Grange Hill. He was in Grange Hill? Grange Hill, yep. <laughs> in season 13 of Grange, series 13 of Grange Hill. I've been, I did listen to your Heaven's Gate podcast earlier oh today. Oh my God, all 30 minutes of it. <laughs> well, you do this thing where you add, I mean, it ends at about 27 minutes, I think. And oh, then okay. the rest of it is just a music clip. Is it? Oh, wait, in fact... No, no, I thought, I listened to the 35 minutes. No, you're right, you're right. I thought it was over at 27 minutes, but then there was a part at the end, maybe two minutes later. 
Um, yeah, I always do kind of music in the like to kind of between that and the end notes, which is usually if I want to do something spoilery or just what the certificate is of the film. But I love the music of Heaven's Gate so much, and you can't it buy does it. Does make me want to buy the, the DVD, the original cut DVD, but it costs twenty pounds. But yeah, oh my god, I love that film. Have you, it's just so beautiful and the music's so lovely. But that review has had like about 12 listens. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, I listen to it too. It's definitely odd because all your, all your podcasts are like 9 to 10 minutes long. This one is like, this is so odd to listen to for us. But it was a good one. I am definitely, if I get a chance, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> it's just like, I feel this film is so maligned. It's <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, I can review it in 10 minutes, in which case I'll just say what the plot is. But it's just so not really about the plot. It's about how it feels and the music and the moment. And No, but, yeah. no the, all the history was good to uh, what happened to this film and why and all that. So it was pretty interesting. I kind of feel like it's like how The Lone Ranger is now. The people reviewed the production, not the movie. Although The Lone Ranger is obviously quite rubbish. Um but yeah, I love Heaven's Gate. I really think it's a better film than Godfather, and I love Godfather. I think it's an amazing film. But yeah, so Wolverine, once again, is super popular. Nearly up to well over 500 lessons, which is good. Are you talking about our Wolverine or yours? Your Wolverine, our Wolverine, the one we all did together. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yep, very good. Wait, really? Yeah. Wait, no. No, that's World War Z. No, oh, 151. Okay. Yeah, Wolverine is only at 151. But it will get there, because it's just not been out as well. <laughs> There's something about the Wolfman. No one can resist him. He's like the Don Draper of Marvel characters. It's interesting, because if you search A Feast for Crows in iTunes, our VOK episode 4 is the second most popular. Really? Yep. <laughs> I search oh, nice. I wish I almost wish we could like go back and recut it just to have the bits where the sound is clear and put out like an abridged version of that podcast. Oh, <laughs> oh I did try removing the noise and things like that, but it was so hard to do. I was trying to find the frequency where the noise was coming from, cut it out, but it was so close to the vocal range that you know it turned out to be a horrible podcast. Uh, or just even like, but you know, take out that because it does get better when we get into the characters. Like, take out the first forty-five minutes when we're doing lemon cake ratings and just go straight into character discussions. Because I feel I really, like, messed up the first 45 minutes of that one. Um, oh, no, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> I just feel so bad. All these people are having to sort of fast forward through it. Um, cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to go get another martini, I think. <laughs> In my homage to Don Draper. Um, okay, unless, that's great. unless there's anything else you guys want to discuss. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I guess, we, yeah. I mean, in a, it's better to do all the rest of the seasons together because otherwise you're not going to have much to talk about have you got so Glenn Sky On Demand box set that's your yep, homework that's uh, the next thing to do in between me reading Gone With The Wind I'm like on I'm on page 150 I've got like 815 pages to go I'm not so. sure how far I am because I'm reading this at uh, this time on Kindle ah and okay it's only 5% <laughs> <laughs> So I'm guessing maybe around 40 to 50 pages. I just forgot, because I haven't read it since I was a teenager. There's so much history in it. It's, um, you forget how much Civil War... Because in, in the film, obviously, it's much more on the romance. But uh, I'm kind of educating myself as I go. Yeah, i got a bunch of ideas to do after I come back. Like, I have this idea for doing something called the Roundtable Podcast, and we'll have different themes like anime, books, or stuff like that. It's meant for this very niche stuff, where, like, we have hosts on, and each host will talk about his favorite thing. Or uh, make uh, book recommendations, or movie exactly. recommendations, right? Okay. Exactly. It will be, like, theme-based. We'll only talk about movies or animes or books or something. But each guy brings up his book and say, hey, you guys should check this out and blah, blah, blah. That's Other really people can idea, asking actually. questions. And maybe at the end, maybe we can all vote on which one's the best <laughs> or which one's the best presented one. Uh, it's basically from this podcast called The Besties. And they do it for video games mostly, where every week they, each one talks about one video game. Uh, so I thought let's extend it and go beyond stuff. Yeah, I guess I'll talk to you guys next Saturday. And what was the final time? It's 11 o'clock at night or midnight? Yeah, yeah. 11 p.m. for you guys. 
11 p.m. for you guys if you want to join. Yeah, oh. please do join. <laughs> well, I might join, but I'm, I, I'm gonna, I will be coming back from a party, so I'll definitely be in the Robert Baratheon wineskin mode. <laughs> I well, it's as sauce, you know, we need all the humor we can. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not inspiring for me, I have to say. But I'm really looking forward to having some new kind of perspectives and, you know, people like Jessica on. I think it'll be interesting. So. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, well, yeah, then thank you for having us on this podcast. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> yeah, and happy editing, dude. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye. I mean, just cut this and put it wherever is appropriate at the end okay. of the show after a speaking door. Um, if anyone wants to is near London and wants to come up to London on Monday, the 19th of August, we have a table for a Game of Thrones pub quiz that's happening in central London that evening. And Erin E's from the forums, hopefully Jedo White Hart and maybe Ted are coming up for it. But there are still places. So if anyone wants to have a little mini Cockney moot, if they PM me being a 007 on the forums, I'll give you the details. Sorry, PR over.